even with fitness, mm. like I enjoy it so much. Yeah. I love lifting. I love uh, exercising. And I can show all the benefit of it to some of my closest friends. And none of them just are even remotely as excited as I am to work out, right? Mm. Um, but what's the best way to go about sharing your message across? I feel more and more as I learn is beyond just saying what's good, telling them the benefits. Mm. I think it's more than, it's beyond just telling them, it is more important to just be the mm. person that is a great investor. Mm, uh, mm, I'm happier mm, now. I'm more financially stable. Mm. I'm able to do more things at the side. That's because I took charge of my finances. Uh, I'm fitter now. I'm happier and I'm, I'm stronger. I feel like I have my health in control. That's because I enjoy and I actually just um, went deep into fitness. Mm, I yeah. don't think telling them works uh, where rather than if I really want them to benefit from it, I'm, I just gotta leave it out. La. Wow, yeah. that's golden words, man. Yeah, man. Just, just leave it out and then then people start to realize people, then when they come and ask you, mm. that's when they are more ready to embark. Before we begin the podcast, have you gotten your free ebook? It's called the Build a Six-Figure Portfolio Guidebook. Now, inside it, we share with you the tips and tricks to bring your stock investing skills to the next level. The best part, it's only 10 pages long and it's totally free. Whether you're on Spotify or YouTube, the link to download is in the description or you can go to www.firl.co slash f-r-e-e or www.firl.co slash free. All right, everyone. Um, first podcast back to the studio. So we need a very uh, nice feeling to guest. have this uh, MJ. Huh? Yeah, MJ. we, in fact, well, you know, we forgot to plug this on <laughs> yeah. because uh, it's been so long. Yeah. Mm. Uh, just for you guys uh, who are watching, you know, you probably realize how close we are, like physically. <laughs> uh, maybe you're a bit worried and you have every right to be worried, but we are actually already double vax, right? Yep. And if there's a triple backs, we'll be uh, the first ones there as well. Yeah. Yellow so, color. Yellow color. Guys. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Proof, proof. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. And, you know, we want to start off with the return to our studio in... With, with a bang. With a bang. Yeah. And someone who is very <coughs> different. Uh, you may have seen his podcast before where we were uh, actually uh, part of it. I think we were the first episode, right? Yep. Yeah, and uh, yeah, welcome uh, our good friend, uh, Mr. Bradley Lim, you know, Brad the Chat. Brad the Chat. Thank you for giving me that name. It's a privilege to be here. Yeah. Feels weird to be on the opposite side <laughs> of this mic, but... <laughs> yeah, we actually didn't realize that this was your first time uh, doing it as a guest, right? I've been on Yamcha sessions. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hello. Always, always <laughs> yeah. 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 Several small ones, uh, nothing as big as viral podcast oh, wow. no, we're not subscribe to <laughs> like 2.2k thank bro. you for the CDA <laughs> 2.3k sub 2.2k yeah. sub bro yeah so um, y- you know we just get right into it and you're not an investor you're not so to speak from the finance space right so some of you all listening might be wondering why we have brought Bradley on and I think it's important because um, you can learn a lot about finance and money actually outside of you know, this bubble we call personal finance mm. or the finance industry, whether it's an analyst or, a, I don't know, a CFA or a, mm. a accountant or whatever. So be, as we all, all our guests, right, I always like to ask, right, what was, a, you know, a young Bradley like and what was the evolution <laughs> of your relationship with money like all the way until maybe high school? Yeah. Bro, you got time. I thought you need to leave. No, uh, no, no, hours. no. Don't worry about it. That, okay. So so what was a 15-year-old Bradley like? Or even a 10-year-old? Okay. Yeah, 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 start yeah. from okay. there and, you know. Good question. I'm going to say, um, yeah, it's a major imposter syndrome, me sitting here. Mm-hmm. I am a very different guest compared to everyone else that you've had mm-hmm. before. But uh, yeah, putting it the way you put it, I think um, I'll try to share, I suppose, my journey and help out whoever that may find my journey as as most well helpful as possible. Yeah. 15 year old Bradley is in form three. I don't think I have any exposure mm-hmm. or a strong relationship with money other than mm-hmm. a weekly pocket money 
uh, requests. Mm, right, right. How mm-hmm. much? How much was it? How much were you getting back then? I think it was fifty ringgit a day. I think a uh, uh, a week. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. Really, it's not bad. It's actually not bad, man. Fifty ringgit. But I, mean, I don't know among your friends. Like, is like, was that uh, normal or was that high or low? Yeah, come to think of it, I don't think at from three there was a huge discussion on like how much money we're getting, mm. how much money we are being given by parents, right? But I think I was quite responsible, irresponsible with the money. I think uh, part of it was spent on food, of course, at school, which wasn't okay. very expensive. Okay. But a huge part of it was also spent uh, in cyber cafes as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're not cheap, right? man. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which ones do you go to? Just curious. There's a few, uh, I come from Klang and there's a few ones in Klang where I, can, I still remember the rates, right? I think it's one hour for 250. Yeah. Um, but if you <laughs> pay for three hours, right, it's five bucks. Oh, so, good deal. Uh, logically, you would I would go for that three hours and then just uh, be a degen there playing whatever <laughs> computer games that were <laughs> most of the time it was Dota ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah that was thing um, not the best introduction to money <laughs> from someone on a money podcast yeah but I think if if I were to paint a better story right I'll bring you to um, my uni days mm, right uni year one <coughs> was when I had uh, a little bit more time and that's a little bit surprising to hear right everyone's like kind of dying in uni mm-hmm. But in year one, I think I had classes till about 12 or one. Okay. And then after that, most of the time you get to do assignments and you get a child. Lah. My cousin told me to join this gym mm. as a part-timer. Lah, okay. Way. And I was like, okay, might as well since um, I, I had started working out and I thought working in the gym might be a great exposure, you know? And okay. I have time, I had time. And I think the basic paid was about I work about five hours a day. I okay. think I get paid 600 bucks a month. Six, so about a, yeah. hun, uh, oh no, a month. So on an hourly rate, I'm just trying to think whether it's better to work in KFC or- work So it's about a 30 hour work week for 600 lah. Yeah. So it's it's not a lot, but basically what I do is I sit in the front desk. Um, I think when clients come in, we tap the card, we give them a towel. Okay. Back then in that gym, we were also <clears> giving them supplements. So it's quite cool lah. Like they come in, they get like a vitamin C, fish oil peel, like poop. Wow. Mm. They usually take it after their training. Okay. So it's a very repetitive job. Sit there, boom. So sometimes I get to do my work there, do my assignments there because um, the boss gave me that liberty and the freedom to do so. I see. Yeah. But um, I'm going to cut. I'm going to cut to where the climax of this part of the story is. A few months later, a lot of the main trainers in their gym left. Oh. So they like, I said, screw this company. I like, cannot work on. Then suddenly there was a void in the number of trainers in their gym to serve the, the trainees, the clients. Mm. And then the boss, knowing that I am a fitness enthusiast myself, I usually work out after I finish my shift at nine to 10 and I close the shop. Then I say, Bradley, why not you try like, training some of the clients here? And then uh, it was really hard. Like, first client was like, hey, what am I doing? I, I basically thought like some aunties who are like <laughs> 60, 50 years old to just start with bicep pros. Not ideal, not the best way to go about training, but through the whole process I learned. And what I want to get to is in two, three months of uh, doing that, makeshift personal trainer role where I was forced into. Uh, as I think an 18 or 19 year old college kid, I think I was being paid about 4,000 a month. Wow. Uh, yeah. And this one thing I remember that made me a little bit not so popular in uh, my classes. Uh, my teacher was asking us in year two of university that, hey, you guys got to start considering finding a job, <laughs> sending a resume to like companies and all that. The market rate for fresh grad uh, is about 2.5. You can get 2.8, you should be very happy. <laughs> yeah, I actually cool. raised my hand at ASA, right? Um, I'm doing a kind of a part-time job as a fitness trainer. I think I'm making about four to 5,000. So is there anything in psychology that pays that amount or not? So you're doing- Wait, wait, wait. So what, what were you studying again? Yeah, in I was doing psychology. Wow, okay. Yeah. So I think she was quiet. She was dumbfounded for a while. Like everyone <laughs> was like, mother, this guy like, sorry. <laughs> uh, MD, this guy. So <laughs> this CEO, this color, what the heck. The lecturer um, may be saying, my gosh, this guy's earning more than me. But he cannot say, he cannot say it. So in, in long, long to short, that was my relationship money. I've always realized that um, at a relatively young age that the amount of time I put in, uh, if I do it right, if I do it well, it goes to a little bit more in return. Mm. So I've never been the biggest fan of a full-time job. Although I did pick up, pick it up for a while. After how long was that? When you Nine months. Uh-huh. Um, and how much did they pay you? you they paid me, me 2.8. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, both average, you know, yeah, yeah, according yeah. to my lecturer. Yeah, yeah. And I okay, just want to quickly share that story of that job, right? I spent the first three months of that job. Um, I finished, first two months, uh. I think I finished season one to season six of Game of Thrones. Not bad. Yeah, productive. <laughs> because, right, I was like sitting where you're sitting. I was uh. like the corner of the office. No one's behind me, no okay. cameras behind me. Okay. I literally got nothing to do. 
Because they couldn't right. assign you anything, right? Correct. Right. <laughs> Two, three episodes a day. So wasn't very proud of that, but uh, I was a Game of Thrones fan when I was at work. Uh, but not after season six, lah, right? Not after season seven. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. So I mean, so when you were at the uh, what were you, what was the job, by the way? Actually, what was this other job? Well, it was a copywriting job. I see. Yeah. Mm. So for it, ads it really, or. It was this like um, this company that required they publish their own internal magazine on mm. a, uh, every two months. Okay, so I was in charge of the content and all that. Lah. Totally nothing to do with my psychology degree, but I think they were the among the higher paying ones. I see compared to the other offerings that you have gotten from a as a psychology graduate. Mm. Yeah, mm. Mm. right. So um, you, you stay there for nine months. Uh, what do you? Why do you quit? And then what do you do after? I quit because, hmm, that's a good question. Let me think about it. What's the right answer? What politically was, correct answer. What was the pivoting moment? The true answer would be, I think that um, I got too comfortable that really there's only so much Game of Thrones you can watch. Yeah. So much Breaking Bad you can watch. Uh, so much YouTube you can watch. Um, and I realized that, and I was also taking part-time clients there who were training with me on the weekend. So it I was see. a decent side income on top of the 2.8K that I'm making. Then I realized, a lot of them actually would like to train a bit more frequently over the weekdays and all that. The whole reason for me leaving there was me doing the math and realizing, actually, if I were to quit this job five days a week that gave me 2.8, if I try to like pick up a little bit more clients, I calculated the number, mm. I reverse engineered the number, I just maybe need about five clients. Uh, maybe, regularly. A week, regularly, is it? Five maybe, a week. maybe six, seven in total. And then I could probably make about three-ish or four, like a pretty good amount, considering that amount of time that I would spend would be way lesser than the amount of time I would spend with a full-time job. That, that's very interesting. And I want to ro- unroll this a little bit. They were probably peers within or colleagues within your uh, mm. company that probably, I don't know whether they had a side gig or anything. Was this ever discussed about the essence of time and then how you should spend your time well? Was there, what was the age group of your colleagues, if you don't mind me asking? You know, mm, that's gonna bring back a lot of memories. I think I was the youngest one there. Okay. Probably there was someone who's older than me was one year older. That's mm-hmm. the closest peer that I have. Mm-hmm. But a lot of them were like 40s, 30s to 40s. And I want to say they're good at what they do. Mm-hmm. They are comfortable at where they are. Mm-hmm. And I think looking back now, right, I think their position also made me realize that if I were to stay on longer, if I were to get more cozy with that 2.8, you give me a 3.2 increment and as it goes up, I might get too comfortable in a job that I don't enjoy. Mm. And I just don't see myself doing for the next, even one year, right? I don't see myself staying there even six months or one year. So I thought, might as well take the plunge and mm. then just go try something out. Yeah. yeah. W- was there a sounding board, like a friend, before you to discuss this uh, decision of yours? Or you, you, you entirely you had that confidence to, to go on? Your own? I think this is something that I have uh, psychoanalyzed myself. I think, and I talked to MJ quite a bit about it. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, as friends, right? I feel like my generation, or maybe just me, mm. that very rarely I have a role model per se to follow. Mm. I think you look up to people who uh, have been your bosses or your mentors for a while, but a lot of them are short-lived because uh, I jump from position to positions. Correct. In college, you have this professor who is there only for one semester and all that. Uh. I think maybe indirectly, some of those um, maybe decision-making or wisdom have kind of rubbed off. I Me, mean, even in fact, these days talking to you, talking to John yeah. uh, and MJ, I'm still learning and I'm still kind of assimilating, you know, some of those... Um, the, the wisdom. Mm-hmm. And I won't say someone really pushed me to do it. I know my parents were against it. Yeah. Um, but I suppose they were against it enough to also understand against it, but not enough to pull me back or hold me back from really pursuing what I want to pursue. Uh, they were very Asian in a way, their mindset, but they are also, I'm lucky enough to have them to be a bit open-minded for me to pursue what I felt that I needed to do. So yeah. what's that like? I mean, like your parents, because obviously uh, your path is unconventional, mm. right? Uh, to excel in personal training, which is what you do today. Mm. And uh, yeah, what was the initial reaction of your parents when they say, you know, you've got this above average uh, job, <laughs> 2.8K, and then you're like, oh no, I'm going to train aunties, how to lift weights, you know? How to do bicep curls, <laughs> hip thrusts, squats. Um, I think, right, and until today, and maybe this is why I've always been a little bit unconfident about what I do. It's mm. because there's always the 
the echo from them that says, hey, this is a good job. You're making good money, but it's not permanent. Mm. It's not lasting. Mm. Mm. What if the next month you suddenly cannot injure yourself and all that, you cannot make this amount. And I think this has been the comment over the past seven years. Mm. And over year over year over year, I've been slowly increasing my Inc- monthly income, mm. annual income, and I've been slowly growing my net worth just by doing a job that, despite me feeling unconfident about, uh, has proven my bank account and myself wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But again, I want to say I'm lucky enough to not have heavy burdens in life, such as owning a house, expensive car, owning like businesses and all that. I think a lot of the money goes to my own personal savings account. And over the years through knowing you guys, knowing some investment channels, starting investing and starting to grow my wealth. So, yeah. That's fantastic. I mean, good that you brought up this point about unburdening yourself. So I'm pretty sure your parents also talk to you about, uh, especially at your age, coming to your age, right? Mm getting a roof over your head, not just from your parents, but from your peers. Is, is that a, a valid peer pressure? Is it people in your age? I love that question. <laughs> uh, because I think I've never really felt like I belonged to any conversation that a lot of adults have when it comes adults. to property, bro. <laughs> okay. like, I'm sure MJ, you can resonate, right? Yeah. We talked about this. Yeah. Uh, I think... Property has made people millions, if not more, during yeah. the boom in 2010 to 2015, 16. Mm. And I felt like, I always felt like, oh, great, okay. I, I always learn it later, la, whatever. La. Mm. Um, and every time people just say, hey, you got money, you should buy property, just put in down payment and you just pay whenever you can start working. Mm. It never really resonated with me. Mm. And in a sense, looking back now in 2021, uh, post pandemic, right, it was a wise move. La. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I've never really felt. Uh, I felt a few peer pressure for sure. I think people moving their own places and whatnot. But I think that beyond the fancy apartments and the fancy bungalows or condos or whatever that they have, uh, comes a very, what's the word? Uh? There's always a cloud over you. Like, oh shit, next month I'll pay this 2.8. Exactly. It's going to be maybe a 30, 40% of my income. Yeah. So much more to go handle. Yeah. So no fan of property, uh, but something that I will have to probably think about in the long term. Uh. Mm. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, eventually you will. Uh, just question when and what circumstance that will happen. Mm. But in terms of peer pressure, right, I've always believed that there is two, predominantly two types, right? So the first one is the one that you create for yourself. So maybe like, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> I'm at the age and obviously you're at the age as well where uh, you know, people are getting married left, right, center. And let's say if you're in a group of friends of 10, right? Like seven or eight are married. You are one of the two that are not, right? (laughs) Then in your mind, you're like, oh, uh, I need to get married. So that's like the first kind. That's the one that you create for yourself. Mm. And then the second type, which is that people actually like sometimes even aggressively like ask you why you not uh, married yet. I think not so much friends, uh, family. Both are, both are like, or like even friends that were, you know, how come you don't have a property yet or whatever, right? Mm. So, you know, do you get, both or you just get one or the other when it comes to a house, let's say, or, or anything else? Mm, I think that I'm thick face enough to be able to divert or put aside that pressure. Mm. Um, but as, as, as rightly as you pointed out, right, a lot of pressure comes from myself as well. Mm. Um, but I'm also lucky enough to hang out with people that are a bit anti-culture in that sense. Mm. <laughs> one of them, one of them is the first thing in front of me right now, <laughs> uh, MJ. Uh, but I do feel like if ever there was a need to start a family, buy a house, or uh, just do what social convention has uh, kind of told us that we need to do, mm. a lot of it uh, has to, and they probably will come from my own desire. Mm. And I have to be very careful to know that it is my own desire, right? It's not yes. actually like constantly being told, hey bro, get married, get married, get yeah. my house and all that. Yeah. Uh, where I think it's important for me. And my own strategy is to sit down, to journal, to really have some peace and quiet to think about things. So Great. that's how I go about it. La. Great. So now you've moved past. So you, you took that plunge, uh, mm. went to be a freelancer. What were the darkest days as a freelancer? If you were to ask, if I were to ask, I mean, definitely there were, there were ups and downs. Maybe you mm. describe first your ups, the day that probably you hit, oh, I've made this much, the highest amount monthly in ever, ever in my career. And what were the darkest days? You know? I think the perks of being a freelancer, and maybe that's kind of like the team of where, and I, I never planned this, right? It's like natural, organic. You guys are digging out of me. Yeah. I never actually thought about it. <laughs> the perks of being somewhat of a freelancer per se, and I, I want to put, out, put it out there, right? freelancer yeah. and entrepreneur is very different. Mm. Freelancer is like someone who's just uh, taking, in a way, it doesn't sound good, taking odd jobs and really just, filling up your bank balances and just growing. Uh, 
security is something that's often lacking mm -hmm. as a freelancer. Mm -hmm. But I would say one thing that I enjoy in my position as a freelancer is I really get to expose myself to a variety of um, different things out there, essentially. Mm. And mm. we talked about this off air as well. Um, we are recently more heavily into crypto, right? We've been <laughs> yeah, researching yeah, yeah. a lot into it. Aping. <laughs> no, I don't think I'll have the time to really read into it. Precisely. To really understand it, uh, to really just go deep enough to make a financial conviction to really buy into some of this crypto. If I don't have the time to read into it or if I don't have communication with you guys uh, who are fellow entrepreneurs uh, yeah. freelancers. Mr. Gabriel. Yeah. yeah of course, <laughs> Gabriel behind the camera as well. Very, yeah. very. Uh, Lord and Savior Gabriel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I call or him the Luna. I just call Gabin. him the Luna God. Gabon. <laughs> yeah. Gabon. So, I, I mean, you know, you, use, you, you said something very interesting just now which is the security of a freelancer, right? Mm. So, I think this will be rel very relevant for people who are already one or tend to become one. Yeah. Um, Obviously, the great part is that you get to do a lot of different things, right? Uh, you get to meet a lot of different people and things like that. But then there's the bad part of the security. How did you combat that? Like, what were your ways? And you said early on that you had like some small confidence issues about mm. yourself because of the family and things like that. But how do you, what are some of the things that you, you, you do or don't do that can help you create that security? I think to answer that question, I think... Um, also, it's important to, as much as it's important to acknowledge what I've done slash achieved, mm -hmm. it's so important to acknowledge how lucky I was uh, in some of these positions. Mm. I think I've always had the, not have the fear of not having a roof to return to. Right. Mm -hmm. Proper, mm -hmm. I live with my parents, right? Mm -hmm. And that allowed me a lot of freedom to really just uh, open myself up to expose myself to what income opportunity out there they are. Mm. One of the largest ones, uh, and I don't mind sharing, was actually this uh, modeling competition that I joined in, in 2014 or 2015. Okay. Uh, long story short, I was in the gym. Someone just came up to me and he said, hey, bro, I think you should join this modeling competition that we have. It's pretty cool and all that. And I said to him, I specifically said to him, bro, I don't want to join like a pageant that you just objectify <laughs> men. And I said, they wear underwear on yeah, stage. Yeah. And then this person just said, hey, no, no, bro. Actually, we are pretty, um, we are very forward thinking. We want to really... Uh, showcase the character of people rather than just how they look. And, mm, and I was like, okay, cool. And I was still very skeptical, but the whole experience throughout, I felt like, hey, it was quite cool. Like they were they were asking you about your beliefs, asking mm. you about like how to actually make the world better and things like that. A little bit like what Miss Universe is, but 10 times or 100 times smaller scale. Mm -hmm. uh, not just like making guys take off their shirts and go on stage <laughs> and walk, catwalk. <laughs> I think, and I won that competition. Wow. And yes. what I won was uh, 10,000 ringgit. Uh -huh. Plus a free Vespa. Because <laughs> <laughs> Vespa was a sponsor, right? Do you and keep I, it? Do you still keep it? I sold that Vespa. Yeah. Uh, too much trouble to get a license. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in a way, security was always a problem, but that has always been proven wrong and wrong and wrong again by just my willingness to really try new things. Uh. Good. Um, and I also took up modeling as a part-time job. And I think that that paid really well uh, when I had the job, it's not like you're going to have like a modeling shoot or a catwalk job every month. Okay. It's like when you have it during say Chinese New Year period, it's got four or five jobs line up. And that sometimes if the jobs are good and high paying enough, it can go up to like five figures. Mm. Uh, and then there's going to be a few months of like a drop, zero. A drop. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course. But I think that the knowing that it's going to happen made me very aware of how important it is to save. Yeah. Mm. Save and invest is very different. I save you just sit in the bank money. Correct. Yeah. For the longest time it has been like that. Lah. And yeah, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, in, in a way it, it does. And it also highlights the fact that by being a freelancer, you are kind of forced to think about those drop months. You are kind of forced to think that it's not going to be a regular pay. Mm. Would that be fair for me to say? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And it is self-reinforced and it's also reinforced by the my family members as well. I see. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And and the part where I asked you earlier about what were your darkest days? What were the, the points in a time when you even thought, oh, crap, I made the wrong move to go into freelancing? Was, was there ever a point? I think, right, there was a point, and I, I talked, we, we mentioned this earlier, that I am able to now be more, push aside what people think and okay. really just work uh, and provide the value that I believe I can mm, provide, mm, right? Mm. But personal training has always been looked down upon by myself. Oh, so yourself. I've always thought that, mm. shit man, I got a degree. 
pay so much money for it. <laughs> and then I'm doing a personal training job where any out, jock out there can do, you know? Any personal <laughs> training. Carry, fitness so. So. Can carry this bar here, you know? Yeah. Turn to, you know. <laughs> yeah. And I think that internal battle has always been, uh, it, it, it's some days I can put it aside. Some days I go work like, shit, man, what am I doing in my life? Right? Mm. Um, but I don't know when, at what certain point in time I realized, actually, I really enjoy doing this. Mm. And if you haven't already noticed, I actually enjoy talking. Yeah, mm, so I yeah. talk nonstop and talk really fast, right? Mm, mm. I actually enjoy the variety of conversations that I can get with clients of all different backgrounds. Yeah, I have a fifteen-year-old girl who tells me about like the latest pop songs <laughs> or what's happening in uh, the social media. Break up, you know. I have a seventy-year-old uncle telling me about his life story. I have a list of company CEOs teaching me like, hey, what's the secret to success? Mm. And I realize it's very rewarding mm. in that sense. And I'm lucky enough to also get paid doing that. Yeah, fantastic. It's cool, mm. man. Yeah. So, I mean, once you get that money already, right? The the, the the good days and all that, then uh, you're talking about saving, investing. Before that, I, I you also mentioned something very interesting, which is your, your, your parents, right? Some of the values that they've mm. instilled into you in terms of money-wise. What were you, uh, what, values do you think you have money wise that you can attribute to your parents or the environment that you had growing up? I think the, the automatic response from that would be that you gotta become self. Uh, <laughs> if you can okay. buy something for like two ringgit off, then you just go for it. Like even though if it's like 10 minutes more inconvenient. Mm. Uh, okay, they're right there. In a sense, I don't think that's wrong, but I think the uh, frugality or the frugalness has brought them to where they are. Mm. But uh, it is something that I think I may not want to adopt or adapt fully as I go into adulthood. Mm. I think they were, frugality made them, brought them where they are, mm. savings and all that. Mm. But I feel like certain things I cannot be too anal about. Sorry we use that word. No worries. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> when it comes to savings. It's just a body part, man. So, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> so yeah, they're very kiamsep. And the kiamsepness kind of stuck to me and I'm somewhat still kiamsep, but I try to know, like as you said, right? Like if you go makan with someone, yeah. Like if you order a pizza and you're split between three people, <laughs> the other fellow say, hey bro, I need two piece. Then you know, a problem. It, you know, it doesn't help that a pizza is a very nice <laughs> geometric shape, right? So you can actually divide it very <laughs> right. equally there. <laughs> yep. The, no, you take off the pepperoni, then it's 50 cents cheaper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but no, literally I have friends like that. It's ridiculous. No surprise, uh, they're from Penang yeah. or so. Okay, that's <laughs> another story. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I like yeah, this video. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so coming back to this, um, your your parents were in business, right? Mm. In a way. Um, did you had friends who were, uh, who parents whose parents were actually employ, uh, employees and do you see a difference in the mindset that you have versus them in a way? I'm mm. pretty sure you make such a wide spectrum of people. Okay, put it this way. Let's just say of the white people, a spectrum of people you've met, people with certain characteristics or mindset uh, versus if they had an upbringing of an employee parents versus a business owner or entrepreneur. Do you see any difference or you don't? Mm, I actually don't have, I don't have a lot of friends. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I think... I, I don't I don't recognize that I don't maybe I'm not observant enough to mm. see that difference I mm. just know that um, when I was in high school versus in college you can really see the difference in maybe not so much parents mm. the peers that you hang out with ah, okay. I think coming from a high school in Klang mm -hmm. uh, if you if you don't know what Klang is Klang is a very Chinese part of our slang or okay. the wilderness uh, according to people yes, from PJ yes. and they say the best best bakute in, in, in Malaysia so so to yeah. speak I, I think that's kind of true yeah if, 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 if you guys may not have the best okay you guys may not have the best but you have the best cluster <laughs> of bakute, of bakute yeah. Cl best yeah, cluster yeah. of bakute. we don't argue with that we yeah. don't argue with that yeah. Yeah. So it was a huge shift when I went from a Chinese school to uh, a private college, so I went Taylor's, right? Ah, okay. And then you start seeing some of the more, what's the word? Privilege. Like the, the fancy- The, the Taylor la, is, the, is the Taylor, the Taylor type. The Taylor kias. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 correct, correct. <laughs> and I think to answer your question, I'm not sure how parenting, the parenting styles differ from friends to friends, but mm. I'm pretty sure I made very different friends in high school than in uh, right. college and university. Yeah. Way, way different. Yeah. yeah. Great. Because th that, that's the part where I wanted to to link to the to your upbringing and, and whether, did it actually give you a little bit more courage and then to go into freelancing and all that? I mean, this is, is a pattern. Mm. Uh, great. Um, so maybe we move on to more of your investing. Okay. 
Right. And NFA. <laughs> not financial advice. Yeah, it's not not financial advice. So what was the trigger point for you to realize that probably savings was was catching not enough, yeah. not enough and you know, you could I've always felt um I don't know what's the word, insecure about my knowledge when it comes to finances. Okay. I think um being able to make a decent income doesn't necessarily mean I can grow it. Right. And I think I've came across and we shared, right? I'm not sure how much we can share, but a blog post that was shared online. Oh. Um not a blog post, sorry, a Facebook uh, post that yeah, shared Facebook online post, made yeah. by someone in front of me. <laughs> I won't say who. And then that really put me into the rabbit hole of A. Actually, right, me making whatever amount I'm making this month, even though I can repeat the same thing again. If I want to continue doing this for the rest of my life, it may not give me Financial security, financial freedom. Mm -hmm, I have mm -hmm. to learn to invest it beyond the two percent FD rates or whatever it is. Mm. At, at that point, at that point, uh, before you saw that poster or that mm. Facebook post, what were you doing with your money? I think a lot of it went to my savings account mm. for the longest time. I mm. think it reached uh, easily reached uh, up to six figures lah. Okay, just cash lah. And then I came across uh, a financial app in Malaysia that got really popular. I think that also helped me to kind of deep dive into growing my wealth. I see. It's one click of a button, just put the money in, and then you see yeah, the chart. Are you, you going to call up who, what the app is called? No. Uh, you, can I? Yeah, yeah. Why yeah, not? I think yeah, it's stash away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I think yeah. that got me into the idea of growing my wealth. And it helps that the chart or the app is so user. It's very uh, frictionless. Correct. Yeah. And then you see like, hey, okay, why not? 2% today, 2%. <laughs> It, it it makes it gamifies the whole process of mm. investing in a mm. way, mm. and then I realized from there, hey, actually this is quite cool. It's quite fun. And what other ways are there to go about this? Yeah, uh, stocks. And then I've always been told that hey, Malaysian stocks cannot pakai, cannot pakai. Then I realized, uh, came across that that Facebook post of yours, mm. and then I realized it was an it was, ad, right? I believe Facebook ad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just just went deep into it, line and realized that hey, investment is it's a beautiful wide world out there. Like. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> Huge. When you jumped into it mm. and you transitioned from your savings and like stash away over into stocks, what were the emotional, uh, I would say emotional conditions that you were going through? Especially after, okay, what was your emotional condition buying your first stock? I remember. <laughs> uh, I still remember buying my first stock. Yeah. And I think my buying stock buying experience is a bit different from people who just take like stock tips from some random uncle auntie during okay. Chinese New Year, right? <laughs> okay. uh, I was lucky enough to do the due diligence or to be given the chance to be able to do the due diligence to attend a like an investor CEO meetup mm. and then sit through it and listen to the CEO talk and explain how his company is doing, how he's going to do going forward. And then I bought my first stock, these weekends. Ah, yeah, okay. ah, yeah. Big yeah. company. Yeah. Bought it. Uh, late 2019. Okay. 60 cents, 5,000 units or something like that. Okay. A few months later, COVID happened. <laughs> <laughs> 40 cents or something. I can't remember. Really, uh, I was, I was, what's the word? Uh? You know what? I think one thing to say that is a very scary experience and all that, it's not going to be true because I feel like having gone to the meetings and mm. knowing the financial data, knowing the plans, expansion plans and all that, gave me a confidence to kind of just Hoddle through, you know? Mm. Mm. So it wasn't that scary of an experience, but um, it was uncertain times uh, for all of us, right? During COVID. Yeah. But I felt like I had the conviction because I know some of the data, financial data and the management and all that. I see. Are you still mm. holding on to it? Sold at a two and a half X. Profit. Wow. It's good, yeah. man. Yeah. 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 Big, so big, big company. Yeah. yeah. Big company. Correct, a, correct. Did you discuss, okay, so when you took that plunge, uh, understood how to read financial data and all that, any of your peers, have you, I, I, I don't know whether you were, were you excited when you bought your first stock and then did you like try to share it with your peers and try to tell it, your family members about all this? Yeah, I think that's the, the annoying part of uh, me as a person, right? Whenever yeah. I discover some alpha, I just want to uh, share it out. And I think the problem would be, with that as I experienced would be the disappointment that comes when someone just isn't ex as excited as you are, uh -huh. uh, especially family members, right? This is exactly why I want to tease out from you actually. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's how I felt like when like say, hey, I think this uh, investment is very important, you know, actually yeah. imagine growing your wealth at 12%, 15% at most a year. Yeah. You can actually outperform like FD in the long, long run. Yeah. And like, I think it's very important, especially if you can take risks at this age, you should go for it. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Chip, then, chip, chip, chip. <laughs> really? Uh, silence. Like I your mean, your friends, you 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 sense that lah. Is it for majority of them? Yeah, I think mm, some of the closer friends that I have lah. Not all of them are super keen or maybe as keen as I am about investing. Mm. Hence, well, I always say our, our bubble here is our little yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> bubble. Right? Well, what why why do you think that is, man? Because yeah. I find that very fascinating. I mean. Some of them even have the same privilege. I assume they have the same privileges. You have maybe mm. even more privilege, mm. and they're less likely to want to take the so-called risk to do this. I I don't know from that aspect. I'm not too sure, but I I've always thought about this, right? Like even with fitness, mm. like I enjoy it so much. Yeah. I love lifting. I love uh, exercising, and I can show all the benefit of it to some of my closest friends, and none of them just. I even remotely as excited as I am to work out, right? Mm. Um, what's the best way to go about sharing your message across? I feel more and more as I learn is beyond just saying what's good, telling them the benefits. Mm. I think it's more than, it's beyond just telling them, it is more important to just be the mm. person that is a great investor. Mm. Uh, mm. I'm happier mm. now. I'm more financially stable. Mm. I'm able to do more things at the side. That's because I took charge of my finances. Uh, I'm fitter now, I'm happier and I'm, I'm stronger. I feel like I have my health in control. That's because I enjoy and I actually just um, went deep into fitness. Mm, I yeah. don't think telling them works uh, where rather than if I really want them to benefit from it, I'm, I just gotta live it out. Lah. Wow, yeah. that's golden words, man. Yeah, man. Just just live it out and then then people start to realize people. Then when they come and ask you, mm. that's when they are more ready to embark. But here's the challenge, right? So if like fitness, right, you can show people how you live it out because you can show people, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. But you know, in finance, it's more you saying that, uh, you know, you've been uh, raised to be kiam, right? right so right. How, how to show men, right? I think this is this is where I suppose you guys also struggle, right? How do you show yeah. um, results from your clients uh, to the, the world? The best part is we show result. We cannot we cannot sound some more. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you sound like who are by your by, by no, our random, random people online. Random people online. online. I thought yeah. the SEC can like you or something. Yeah. <laughs> no la, no. Yeah. I, I I remember this thing. Speaking of investment, we didn't really touch on this. Actually, I'm not sure how much you can share about this. We've had I think short conversation about this before. I don't think John mm. is aware. Yeah. Actually, before stocks and crypto, whatever you're doing right now, mm. uh, you actually invest in the business, right? Yeah, the gym business. Oh. We talked about it before. Right, yeah. right. Yes, yeah, yes. We, we repress it uh, to the side. I don't want to put it out there. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a business that uh, we were sourcing fitness equipment, mm. uh, primarily from China and the Philippines. And then we kind of sold it here to some of the various gyms that exist here. Mm. Uh, we were more focused on the CrossFit side of things. So see. that would mean more barbells, more Olympic plates, some of these squat racks. Uh, less of those big machines that you see in yeah. commercial gyms. Mm. So I invested in it. And I suppose the major lesson learned from it was that uh, you really have to find a partner that has aligned similar values to you. I see. But yeah. and during that time when you partnered this guy, I'm pretty sure there was good vibes, good chemistry and all that kind of thing. But mm. obviously in hindsight then, but what were the, okay, putting emotion, putting putting personalities aside, what were the things that you, you, you think that you guys could have done better operationally or revenue generation or what, what, what were the thing, key business aspects that you could have done better that to, to prevent this from happening? Okay, I think, I think one thing about the fitness business is that, and this is this is me speaking from some of experience. Yeah. I think running a gym is a very costly business. Mm. I think if you look at the dynamics or the cost of it, especially if you buy like a treadmill for maybe 10,000 bucks, wow. a good one. Okay. And you buy like a bunch of it and the cost goes up to like half a mil, for example. Okay. And a gym typically costs about 80 ringgit per member. Wow. Just do the math. Yeah. Like it's going to be really hard for you to recoup the ROI, mm. um, unless you have a really, really jam-packed gym. I understand. Right. I think um, the thing about my, the business that I did was we want to be, this analogy is always used by Peter Lim, right? We, uh, we wanted to be the paper in the printer industry. You know? uh. So we wanted to be the fitness equipment distributor <clears throat> to a wide industry, a uh, booming industry of fitness, mm, supply mm. equipment to various gyms and various mm. CrossFit boxes. Uh. But I think the failure point was, which was very apparent, which I didn't notice, was when um, there were a lot of big financial decisions or un irresponsible financial decisions made by the partner. Mm. He wanted to buy more stock, wanted to expand too fast without uh, actually having a stable clientele. I see. Uh, no effort was put into branding. And I think Marketing. it was a 
And it was slowly becoming a red ocean amongst a lot of other competitors out there also supplying the same equipment. I see. So you, yeah. he was piling up a lot of inventory, but not clearing out the inventory before. Right, correct. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't have that vocabulary to put it that way. Like right. Yeah, yeah. True, true, yeah. true. Okay. But I mean, of course, but what excited you about the business to begin with, right? Is it because you're in the industry and you know how the potential it was? Or it was literally just like, hey, I'm just going to put a bunch of money and let's see, what's hap- see what happened. 24-year-old me or 25-year-old me, that's five years ago, turning 30 soon. Um, yeah, I think that was the predominant thought. Like, mm. hey, I'm, I've am i worked so hard to amass this amount of wealth. And I realized that hey, actually, yeah, the natural path for a person going forward from a employed to a self-employed freelancer should be an entrepreneur. Mm. And I had a bit of money and this company needed uh, support. So I went in as like a, uh, bought some equity in the company. Mm, mm. Not knowing that uh, being an entrepreneur is never as easy as just putting money in the company. Yeah. Uh, like that. Are you are you comfortable to share the amount of money you lost or it's it's like a I think I put in about six figures <coughs> in total six figures plus. Mm. I think I got back five figures. Oh yeah. you still got back something. I got okay. Something. Yeah. Okay. L- lost by at least fifty percent or sixty percent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it was not a complete write off. Okay, mm. cool. Coming back to equities and and, and um, stocks. I'm pretty sure when your parents or your peers uh, saw that you were getting into equity versus that, oh, why don't you buy property? You know, mm. we, I, I remember we had this discussion before Bradley about, um, you know, your, your property and all that. What, was there a very uh, strong, what do you call it, descendant to you getting into stocks from your family members or your friends or, and then they said you should have chosen a better asset class? I think that I think for a lot of the family, my family side, my mom and dad side, right? Yeah. Property is a very strong. I think everyone has their own opinions on property. <laughs> okay. And it's very hard to have a proper conversation. You, know, you go in the property, you're like, hey, uncle, what do you think of this uh, store, this property here in I don't know what, La Banda, Saujana, whatever. Then he will go on a 10 minute rant on like, oh, why is this, you should buy this and buy that. Mm. I find that very off-putting. Mm. Um, when it comes to stock, I feel like it is some pe- people just buy, you know, the top few stocks like Genting, Asia, Maybank. And I feel that it's easier to for me to go into it because people are just kind of touching the surface, but they've never delved so deep into as deep as they did into property, wow. right? Mm. Where I realize, hey, maybe I can have a better edge if I really put a little bit of time to learning about ah, stock investing. Okay. Yeah. In a way, I want to flex my superiority compared to everyone else in Chinese New Year. Like, <laughs> yeah. You only know good thing, you didn't know Asia, is it? Yeah, show you what's uh secret. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, this weekend now they are in partnership with Kobe. Uh, Kobe. Kuku? Kobe. Kobe. Kuku is the dispensing, water dispensing machine. Yeah. Kobe also got it. Right? Yeah, Kobe. More than that. Yeah, so. Okay, great. Um, Were there any fears or mm. any point in time that you had uh, fears when you looked at your portfolio, especially, let's say, during the COVID, mm. COVID crash? You know, I mean, we, we talked about this and, uh, you know, we, we're in some common groups and we were having this side discussion about, wow, uh, is this a black swan event? I don't, mm. I don't know if you remember that conversation. I think I did. I yeah, did. and it was about Pandini, remember? And then someone said, uh, if it's another lockdown, MCO 2.0, it's going to be yeah. a black swan event. And then they were like, can you please update the portfolio every uh, other day? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we won't go too much into that, but I think you know exactly yep, what. Yep. So, and you were saying that prior to you, you know, uh, applying and experiencing yourself, it was very difficult to get over the emotional barrier to have that confidence. What do you think helped you overcome or are you still overcoming that confidence of hodling and all that? MCO1 uh, happened in May, March, right? Yeah. I think I was lucky enough to, and again, a, a, lot, of, a lot of my success, I would say, uh, thank you to you guys for helping help me out through the journey. Uh, but a lot of it also fell down to just just luck la, in general, for my, for me, at least from my point of view. Mm. And so one, I, I bought into a few stocks in January, February, because I've really learned investment in December 2019. Mm. So paint the, time, the timeline about a better picture. Because we met, I believe, uh, in September, October-ish. Yeah. Correct, correct, quarter, right. quarter 4, 2019. Yeah, yeah. it's a few yeah. months before the pandemic. Like, wow, yeah. it's, been, uh, it's been almost a couple of years. Really. Yeah, it's coming to two years already, man. Oh. Actually, it's two years already. Yeah. Yeah. Time flies. Yeah. yeah. And I think I was having a really busy period in early 2020. Mm. I actually allocated a lot of, uh, a bit of cash to the portfolio, right? But never really, boom, dive into, yeah. into, into it, you know? So I bought 
Uh, I just remember I bought this Ucat, I bought SLP. I bought a top glove, bought ES Ceramics. Mm. And I think I had 40% cash in my portfolio, right? Okay. And everything crashed. And I think that was during March. And one of the morning I wake up, just 9.05 p.m. Went into the Kananga app. Boom, <laughs> big rate uh, down, downward trend, downward yeah. graph, right? Yeah. And I realized, actually I still have a bit of money. I'm just, uh, just gonna listen to some of this. Uh, there was a lot of property, sorry. There was a lot of stock live stream that's going on during ah, that time. Ah, right? yes, yes, yes. Listen yes. to it, understand the general sentiments, despite it being literally a black swan, right? We yeah. haven't experienced it before. Yeah. Um, people were generally not, maybe I was in this bubble, not too man gloom, they're not, it's not the end of the world, you know? Mm, like mm, things mm, still mm. need to run, certain prop industries still need to go on. And back then it was thought to be a two week thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, based on that bubble that I was in, I was lucky to be in, people who have strong conviction with their investment, I doubled down and invested a little bit more during that time. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You were part of it. You guys were part of it. You guys mm. were in also. Credit yeah. to Viral Guys. <laughs> No, I mean, we, we, we are, we're very humble that, you know, we cross paths. But also, I think why I'm teasing that question out to you is that I'm pretty sure your peers or family around you mm. would have like, you guys nuts are huh? investing during this time. <gasps> you know, or, you know, why your friends would be asking you, huh? better save, man. You know, the market is going to go even mm. even more south, that kind of that kind of fear. And I mean, you know, I, I keep on telling MJ this, it's a perennial struggle for us as content creators, as full-time investors, right? Mm. We have people who are in involved directly into listing of public listed companies, and they're so fearful of investing. Yeah, and here we have, uh, you know, I mean, one of the reasons of our podcast is also to get people like you who have, we want to we want to hear your story, your your emotional journey going through that, and what was the the ecosystem around you to either help propel you or help pull you back, mm. and we wanted to understand that from your aspect you rely a lot on yourself and whatever you have gone through and what you uh, you know we have shared and what you have picked up but outside your your let's say your girlfriend your your parents or whatever and if you ever discuss this did they ever doubt you did they ever doubt whatever actions that you take and then did it have an impact to you obviously you have a psychological de- psychological <laughs> degree <laughs> you can yeah. help channel out but was it noise at that point i think i'm a little bit in that sense, right, I'm relatively private when it comes to my finances. Um, I think what really gave me the confidence to to really go a little bit deeper with my investing during the uncertain time mm-hmm. was very much, and this is something that is taught in the FIRO SIB. You guys sign up, use my promo code. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah use this promo <laughs> code, promo okay? Code, <laughs> put it in the whatever. Put it in the link description. <laughs> yeah. Was portfolio allocation. Right? Mm. Stocks is a huge chunk of my net worth, but it's not 100%. Mm. It's probably, I think, 40, 50% back then, maybe okay. a bit lesser than 50. Okay. So within that 50%, I'm not going to put all in one stock, right? So okay. I kind of really just uh, allocate 10%, 20% to bigger conviction names, yeah. 5% smaller ones. Yeah. And that, even just that knowledge, knowing that whatever I put in here, even if it goes to zero, it's not going to kill my portfolio. It's not going to mm. wreck me, right? Mm. Was where I gained a lot more confidence to really go into, uh, take some of these more aggressive positions that I took. Yeah. Great. And I want to go back to one thing that I think I talked to you about before yeah. you guys started viral, uh, viral Guys, right? Yeah. I think that it's, very, it's more important, rather than being a millionaire, uh, it's much more important to have the mindset of a millionaire. Mm. And I think that maybe that's where the problem, the listing company for the, he had, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he may be a millionaire, but he may not have the mindset that um, investing up and downs are going to happen. You just got to understand the company and just hodl through. Lah. So yeah. that's something I, I remember you talked to me about it. So I just want to bring it up. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's like a hidden secret, right? Because when people think of investing in stocks, actually what they do is they, they think of investing in a stock. Yeah. Mm. And so like the, the kind of all the hopes and all the dreams or, or, or whatever is, is is predicated on that one thing. All in. Yeah. <laughs> all I, you in know, yes, I guess yeah. if you have <laughs> small amounts of capital, that's not really an issue. Yeah. But when you have family to feed and you've got you've got a nest egg, I, mm. I think that kind of mindset is very, very dangerous. Uh. Now, uh, one very interesting thing that uh, I would like to learn about as well, and I say learn, not just know, yeah. is uh, actually... Because you're now, you're, you're not single, right? Mm. And you're attached. And 
one of the most interesting questions to ask is always money management with a partner. Now mm. you guys are not uh, at the stage of uh, marriage so far, but having you know been in a relationship or re even relationships in the past, or right, you can draw experience there. Like, what has it been like talking about money? Uh, are there talks about combining finances? Um, do you all see eye to eye on everything, or if you guys don't, what you guys don't see eye to eye on? Why is that the case? Things like that. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, shout out to Antel, my girlfriend. He's watching this. <laughs> Apple, Instagram in Apple Instagram. Apple <laughs> Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so many links gonna be there. Yeah, man. Uh, I feel like I think it's, it's a conversation that needs to be had, lah. To mm. be honest, yeah. I think that having gone through relationships in the past, I know that the unsexy but practical aspect of it needs to be laid out uh, in front. Mm. It, even if it needs to be a contract, I feel, but we didn't go to that extent. <laughs> um, but we realized that, hey, if we are serious and we want to bring things forward and we want to start a life together, um, being stupid about finances is just not going to cut it. Mm. Like, hey, how often do you want to eat that? Thousand ringgit omakase meal how, every week or some shit. You're going to, every single decision like that that you make, uh, you still have to have fun. Yes, yeah. but if you do that often enough, it's going to cause a huge dent in Bradley five years later, mm. yeah. Bradley Junior five ten years later, right? Yeah. Until Junior fifteen years later, yeah. And I think we kind of had that sense that it's very important for us to have proper financial management. Mm. Uh, we do a lot of uh, she does a lot of spreadsheet for us wow. to help us wow. manage wow. it. How much money uh, are we spending this month? Are we within our budget or not? And they, and and shout out to my girlfriend. She's very good at uh, knowing how to spot deals and use mm. some of these points, Ooh. you know, big pay, you can upload to your grab and you spend with grab <laughs> and you get both points. And then sometimes you get really good deals out of those. Although this is like alien language and foreign language to me. It's basically so crypto it. la, So when people- Crypto to us. Is, yeah, it's other people, <laughs> nor normies, right? Like, yeah. oh, uh, uh, bridge here, bridge there and all that. So, <laughs> so when they find deals, I think it's the same, uh, right? Yeah, 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 that's right. It's good, good to be I, Actually, I, I can totally relate to that because I, it, like my sister and friend, my friends who are girls are that, mm. they're like, they're, Excellent at that age of deals. Shopee. Yeah. Like, age of turning it off. Uh -huh. oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Play bye, that bye. Shopee game. Uh, uh, plant water your plants in Shopee. Like oh, what's yeah. going on? <laughs> your coins, you get coins. Collect your coins in Shopee. This coins you go to money. No, no, it's not money, but it's something useful. <laughs> yeah. Some, somehow that's what they excel. Yeah. Sorry. Con continue. If if there's uh, more like in terms of, uh, you know, money beliefs and so uh, spreadsheets and then deals and then do you guys even like plan out like. Sh there's a cap on how much you're gonna spend on a wedding or whatever. Do you go? Does the conversation go that far? I think we should have. I haven't gone to that depth okay. with her yet. Yeah. Um, but I also think that what's the word to use? Uh? I also think that I have this belief that I think we need to have a what's that word? A fund. I think a shared fund mm, in the okay. long run, so okay. that. It kind of is like a what's that? Like a war chest, you know, like it's uh, a totem, uh, <laughs> a war chest where we can utilize that in the long run for whatever it is, like important life decisions, ultimately buying a property, children's fund, and all that. Mm. But also beyond this kind of shared capital, we should have our own uh, split, savings. Split I think fund that up. way is the best of both worlds. Uh. Yeah. So, so that's a very interesting question. Now, obviously, you're not at that, that stage yet, right? But mm. I know this is something that when I watch uh, people in America, they they discuss this a lot about. So now. You are right in that there should be essentially three different parts. One is your money, her money, and our money, right? Yeah. I thought so, it's, I thought it's her yeah. money is no his money is her money. And she her got tips on all all three, yeah. la, right? I just you know <laughs> yeah, yeah your, yours in theory, la, you know. <laughs> so uh, one question, and this one actually causes quite a little bit of debate is so both of you earn an income, right? Do you all? Well, where do you stand? Obviously, you're not there yet to decide, but do you receive the income in your respective accounts and then go into this central Shit. one? Yeah. Or do you both tell your employers or whoever to put, in put into the share account and then split yeah. out after that? That's interesting. Why, why, why is it more common in the West? Huh? No, sure. it's not less. No, so it's more common in the West yeah. for the first one where you know I, it's my money, and you know in the West things are a little bit more individualistic. So it's yeah. like hey, it's my money, like why? And so then it's kind of like okay, how much do you want to contribute into this mm -hmm. fund? But the flip side of the argument is that if you have income all into the central fund, you're not hiding anything. Mm. Uh, trust. So you are ex yeah. yeah, extremely transparent. This is the amount I earn, right? And then you split out from there. 
and then basically you you want your fun money right mm. maybe you want to have fun drinks or you want to buy a car or whatever she wants to do whatever she wants to do and then you split up from there where do you where do you, what do you think about this i don't know i think if i were to put myself in the shoes of 20 year forward i feel like I feel like maybe there should be a designated amount that we should both contribute based on our capacity mm-hmm. to that war chest. I'm calling it war chest for some reason. Yeah, no, it's good. Uh, <laughs> it's good. It's a good war chest. <laughs> but I, I don't know whether or not it should all be put in there and then withdrawn though. I, I don't quite like the idea based mm. on where I am now, but I do, I've seen, um, I think managers get wrecked because of some of this lack of trust when it comes to finances. Uh, yeah. Where I think a partner realizes that uh, the husband is making way more than he should be putting into the more into the war chest. Is that the problem that you? Yeah, you know what up? the second. You know what the second <laughs> option really is. What? It's a blockchain. <laughs> Everything it's is a uh, immutable. Uh, it's a two node blockchain. Okay? Immutable, immutable. Okay, it's, a, it's, a, it's a two node blockchain. Uh, everyone in the blockchain, two of you all, can see what's happening. <laughs> okay. So that's 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 why I brought this interesting. So you can you are starting to see right like why I brought that up because it's not a. Uh, it's, it's not talked about, like no one really think about it, but when you really actually put it into practice, yeah, actually it does uh, uh, adds a different spin. I don't know, maybe John can come into this. Yeah. But I know you are a single, to be fair, a single income. Single la. income, but I, I, actually my wife has access to all my accounts. Every oh. single one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. so, so she does the same with me. And the, the reason for me doing that is actually this, uh, I've, I, I'm trained I, I've not gotten my full certification, but uh, I've been exposed to uh, estate planning and all that kind of thing. And mm. I've att- attended probably easily three or four times estate planning. And I realized one thing, people don't like to talk about the afterlife because it's morbid. Of course. Mm. Right? But I realized that why people should talk about it is because you think about the pain it leaves someone behind with. And and in, in, in I think in Muslim or in Islam, they said you want to go to heaven, but don't leave hell behind. I don't know if you heard. Wait, 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 if you want to go to heaven, heaven don't, don't leave, oh, okay, don't okay, leave okay, hell yeah, behind. Okay. Meaning your family leave, members. Or? Yeah, your dads and all this kind of things. Then so, if you're going to hell, don't leave heaven behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't leave them like, you know, yeah. leave, leave enough that they can marry off their driver yeah, or something. Yeah, right? yeah, just, yeah. just kidding. But the reason why I, 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 I'm, I'm glad uh, this was brought up is because even though uh, for me as a single income uh, and uh, the sole breadwinner, the, the the family, my wife had to give up the, have to sacrifice her career and her financial independence. Right. Because she had to, uh, took the plunge to take care of my kids. And we knew it was a, it was a, it was a decision. We both came up together. And because of that, I cannot be denying her of some kind of financial independence and security. So in the past, when I was still working uh, with a stable income, I pay her a salary every month actually. Ooh, wow. mm. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is that uh, because she does not have EPF anymore, mm. so I created an EPF fund for nice. her. Nice. So that's the that's the that's her stock portfolio that I manage. That's uh. great. That's great. Yeah. So why I'm sharing, and I'm glad M- M- MJ, you know, brought up this angle because money is very emotional. Sad to say. <laughs> in family and everything is very emotional. Why we, uh, you know, we train ourselves as investors, try to think as objectively, as as non-subjectively as possible. Money is a very emotional thing because it buys you options, it buys you freedom. And, That's right. And, and I, it's a good example that, you know, transparency and then you split out, right? Uh, I, I guess one way that I did was to give my wife that kind of confidence. Hey, you know, even if I go and marry a, a yeah. mistress or something, right? There's assets under your name. Mm. And I, I plan it in such a way that all the debt burdens are on me. Oh. Mm. So that means, and you see, I, I don't know about uh, when you guys find girlfriends, right? Usually the most obvious choice is the house must be split to two, ma, tighter. Mm. Yes. Right? It's a very common belief. Ma. But that has its problems when in worst case scenarios, you want to sell it. Exactly. Like that, right? Exactly. And I've seen so many people who are property investors as couple and then when they divorce or oh, that's wow. it. Man. Oh, I tell you the, the drama. No, right? actually like, you know, the, the only thing worse than that is if you, it, it's not your name, but you're paying for it. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or, or, or even uh, co-signing loans. Yes. Like, like maybe you are a, uh, 
like your your dad wants to buy a house, then you co-sign a loan with him, and then he went uh, and yeah. messed up big time. Then yeah. you have to pick up the bill, especially your guarantor some more. Yeah, ah. your guarantor. So no one teaches us this stuff. Man. Yeah, exactly. And it's so sad. So yeah. law, it's so legal nonsense. So right? so what I so I what I found. I mean, this is my my way of solving the problem, lah. Yeah, she doesn't have income, ah, and yet the house, everything in my name, right? What if I really? I mean, let's let's all be practical. What if I really go and marry a mistress or I get a second wife or whatever? So the way I alleviate that was that I return a will and she knows about the will. Yeah. So it means property, if anything happens to me, right? If I'm dead and then if I marry, it's already will to her. Oh. So you see, even though the debt is on me, name is on me, but because the loan is also on me. Ma, so in when it comes to insurance, uh, uh, estate planning and insurance planning, okay. I'm actually fully insured to make sure that if I go first, then she gets everything unencumbered. But at the same time, giving her the security that even though there's nothing in your name now, the will is already very clearly written. Nice. Okay. So in a way, it's like I'm trying to solve. Uh, this is the way I, I'll solve it, lah. So I don't know. I mean, some, I know some, and we have a joke. Uh, no pun intended to West Malaysians. <laughs> okay, we say Sarawakians, right? It, mm. It's kind of more trustworthy. Is that the joke in Sarawak is that if your son or marries a, a West Malaysian girl, you're more likely that the 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 or the hartana the hartana the, everything is like you know it's gonna be like swindle. It's a joke like It's a running oh, okay, joke, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No so trust, a, uh, no trust for us West Malaysians. <laughs> yeah. Hey, no, no, no. It's, it's exactly what we talk about, say about Singaporeans. So <laughs> we understand, we understand, <laughs> <laughs> understand. Right? Yeah, but it, it it's a good point. I mean, there are many many ways to solve it. But I think having an honest conversation and laying the cards on the table is very important, uh. especially yeah. like what you say, Lord Bradley. No one teaches us that, Lord. I just had to like so unsexy to talk about. Yeah, yeah. and it's so morbid. And it's like, why are you so calculative? Why are you so materialistic? No, I'm not being materialistic. I'm just being practical. You know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I want to get back to a, a bit on uh, your finance, right? And basically, what is in your view enough? And I, I always use the word because I I always remember this story of uh, these two guys uh, at a cocktail bar. It's a true story, but I can't remember what was the guy's name really. And there were a bunch of uh, rich people, you know, and they're all like basically sh showing off like, how much they have or I'm mm. worth 100 million, whatever it is. And then uh, this guy A uh, turned to guy B and asked guy B like, hey, you know, what's, uh, what, what's your net worth or something like that? And then Guy B just said enough. Wow. Oh, so that was very that was really powerful, right? Because then it's like uh you, you kinda answer the question but not in detail, but people understand what you mean by that. So I guess what is enough for you, right? If you if there is a specific number and mm -hmm. also like how much a month would you say, right, that you know, now obviously a lot of it's heavily dependent on your active income, right? Like uh, yeah. meeting clients. Uh how much is a month enough for you a month? And how much do you think your war chest, right? Mm. You, when you reach that, then that's when you say, okay, uh, I have arrived. That's a very good question. And one that I should put more attention into myself. Um, what is it already? Yes. So I like, I like the quote, I like the quote, um, how does it go again? It basically says, if you don't know how much you need, the default easily becomes more. So maybe ah, that kind of resonates, wow. with, resonates with what your experience wow, was. Okay. Uh, I don't know, man. Like, okay, wait, wait, wait. You know what? Wanna, let me put on the interviewer role. Okay. You, how do you, how yourself, you yourself think about? It. Okay, yeah. So your question is, how would I do it, right? Mm. So first I was asked like, how much do I uh, need a month? And that is the first and probably most important question because it's not just how much do I need a month now? It's how much will I need a month eventually? So, um, for me, if like, if I'm single, for example, honestly, like three, 4,000 ringgit is enough, mm. right? Um, and I, I assume I, I don't have to save any of this, or I can use all of this just to spend. So let's put that, put that to 5,000 ringgit, right? So at, 5,000 ringgit, that's about 60,000 a year. So basically I need to find something that can pay me 60,000 a year without uh, the principal reducing. Mm -hmm. Then it's also, then I settled the, how much do I need a month? Then I need to extend that to, how long can I do this for? 
And so obviously taking into account inflation, things like that, right? Mm. You probably need to multiply by 25, 30, 35, right? So let's say it's, it's 30 and you need 60K a year. It means that you need to have 1.8 million ringgit in two days value. Inflation adjusts. So... I mean, there's more to it, but that big is my brain, number. Big brain math. So 2 million, let's say 2 million. That's okay, it, okay. right? And of course, this is assumption that, uh, you know, it, the 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 pot, right, only grows at a meager percentage. La. So if you hit your double digit returns or, you know, triple digit in some cases, then then that'll be fine. But 2 million is the base of, okay, for, for okay. me, for example. So no, no. So what if you have a friend that like, it's just a point where they kind of compare with you say they have 10 million or like 15 million. You gotta be disciplined enough to not go down the rabbit hole of compa- comparing with them. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. That is that is probably, you know, I was reading, um, uh, I, I, I think it was actually the Bible, hmm. right? Um, and I can't remember what is the exact quote. Uh, maybe I'll pull it up later. But basically, uh, you were saying that the, the, the fool is the guy who, keeps toiling. Oh. The guy who folds his arm is a lot smarter than the guy who keeps on toiling. So I, the guy, the guy who just chills lah, basically okay. because he's ultimately doing it. And you know, the guy who is folding his arms and the guy who's toiling every day, night and day, night and day with no rest, uh, both are essentially going to be maggot food. Yeah. Right. So who is the, who, who's the smart one here? Right. Basically. So, um, it's not a a verse or a point of view that tells you to not go for money, mm. but it's a verse to tell you that it's not everything. And, you know, basically, yeah, basically it's just not yeah, everything. Yeah. And you need to reach a point where the additional, okay, I'll give you something more specific, right? When I, Going from zero to a hundred thousand, that was like that was felt like an achievement. But every incremental six figure that I get right from then on, right, yeah, actually not much change. Right? <laughs> That's the truth, uh, and I'm fortunate. I I'm actually fortunate that 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 has happened as in, to me essentially but that's mine. So what's yours? Now I've given you like uh, the the formula, right? Okay, thanks for the formula. Uh. I want to say I if I were to put a target monthly income, it's going to be a very broad sense of what Ranger. I'm spending now. Mm-hmm. Let's just multiply it by two. And I know it's a very imperfect formula, but it's a start la, that I'll have, right? Multiply by two. Mm. Whatever you're spending now, multiply by Con- two. Considering that if I have a, once I have a partner, that's right. And got to cater to the needs and some of our bigger needs like property and all that. I think that's a very simple way for me to look at it. I probably got to consult you on... Uh, Mm-hmm. how to really go about constructing this more elaborate inflation adjusted uh, plan, right? Mm, but but I think, I really think that a better way to go about thinking about this is what you just said, you know, like really realizing what is truly enough and we're going damn philosophical here. Yeah. Because even with fitness training, there is, um, there's a point where you want to re- you realize that- How big do you want to get, right? Yeah, how big do you want to get? Like- you realize that getting bigger requires you to put 80% more effort uh, rather than just maintaining. Are you going to be willing to sacrifice the amount of energy, time, social life, whatever it is, right, that you can do outside that can give you a richer, more colorful life than just eating chicken breast and like living, living with a barbell and sleeping in the gym, right? So I think to answer your question, uh, yeah, think about it, man. It's hard for me to give you a figure, but you know what? To the moon, man. Yeah. That's, uh, that's the capitalist in me thinking, man. To the moon. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of that, right? I know you're uh, you're also into crypto. We're all into crypto as well. Yeah. And I want to get a sense of like, when do you start, like when do you get into contact with crypto and Bitcoin and, you know, what are essentially, uh, what are your views on it? Hey, you know what? This is a good question. And I only started crypto about, started crypto, but I only bought, my first Bitcoin and Ethereum in early 2020. Mm-hmm. Bad timing, like considering how everything tanked in March. But um, I want to say it's been a huge learning curve since then. Since, I mean, everyone's first coin is Bitcoin and Ethereum, right? Once I bought that, I started thinking, reading about things like Cardano, ADA, 
I'm going to XRP mm-hmm. shitcoin. Oh, I mean, no, uh, what? Uh, uh, okay. XRP crypto. And then you go into some other smaller caps and you realize that hey, it's more than just a freaking token with a price tag, right? Yeah. And then I went into some of the DeFi crypto and then I went into, lucky enough to meet Lord and Savior, Gabriel yeah, behind Gavin. the camera, Gavin, to Lord learn about Gavin. Luna. And I really think it's, it's really eye-opening and interesting. I, I want to say not financial advice, but everyone should have a small percentage. You define that however you want to in crypto. Hey, right? hey, isn't that, shouldn't you replace the word with Luna? Uh, so can also, can also. NFA, NFA, yeah. right? So, I mean, like, what do you, uh, what was like some things that you realized about studying the space that made you go like, wow, okay, that's just, this is different and very interesting. Mm, you know, that's a, was question. it like mining? Was it uh, like? Yeah, in fact, I do a bit of uh, mining, Ethereum mining myself, right? But I think the idea, maybe the philosophy of it all, you know, that the predominant philosophy of like, screw the banks, man, like the decentralized economy is the way forward. I quite like that idea as much as I'm not sure whether it will ultimately succeed how Satoshi wants it to be, right? All right. But I think the participation in it, uh, at least putting a little bit of your money as a hedge against like, uh, for it, uh, with it, is a smart play. Mm. Yeah, but how about you? How about mm. your own thought process on how you navigate crypto? Yeah, I mean, it was very straightforward. I mean, I got into contact with uh, Bitcoin. So I was always, uh, so funny enough, I was always, I, I always started, or I don't know what I'm saying. I started investing as a gold bug, actually. So I, I uh, before I learn about Warren Buffett or mm. learn about uh, stock investing, value investing or that, I was a go bank, right? Because I was, uh, I think it was 2014, I was a bit lost and I just needed to find something interesting to learn and, you know, hopefully build a career on. And I actually discovered a video. Uh, this is actually mentioned in the first, the very first podcast, uh, but I actually discovered a video uh, on Peter Schiff, right? Mm-hmm. Peter Schiff talks a lot about how essentially the global financial system is screwing all of us with uh, ever declining interest rates and then low s- high quality low supply assets like uh, stocks uh, oh. real estate um, and then specifically like growth stocks tech stocks and then how things like vcs and angel investors have all these like special deals which you know the pu- public will never be able to get and by the time that it reached the public market mm. Uh, is usually sold at an overvalued price and you will only make money of it after maybe a crash, right? So if you buy an IPO, chances are you're not going to do well, right? Mm. Um, this was the case even for someone like Amazon and all that. But anyway, so I, uh, so that's when he started talking about Go and how Go essentially is the hedge to prevent ruin, right? Because if you think about it as a, as a millennial, you have... Uh, you have money, maybe you start earning money and you have only a little bit of capital, right? Mm. You're not going to get into real estate. You can't do that. It's too difficult. Stocks, because of all the money printing and low interest rates, uh, you're going to buy high quality stocks, right? Your Disney's Coca-Cola and all that at a higher valuation, which means uh, by definition, the returns you get from those uh, assets are going to not be very high. Um, That said, I then understood about Go. I bought some Go and all that. But I understood still more about the stock market and that's when I knew, hey, actually it's not about looking at the stock market as whole, but looking at pockets. So mm. the whole market in general by historical standards might be higher, but there are certain pockets that are going to be very undervalued. And I've done, you know, decent, decently well in, in those pockets. So in 2017, I then came across this idea of a cryptocurrency with Bitcoin, right? And I think it was at peak or like approaching the peak, the, that, that peak, right? That was like the 20, 2021 K Bitcoin peak. So I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, I totally believe in this, right? Like this is definitely the future. Uh, I never doubted the thesis for crypto. I only doubted the security. One, you could only, uh, I don't even know how to buy it, right? And even if you could set up a Coinbase account or whatever back then, uh, the fees were big. Uh, of course, in retrospect, the who cares about the fees? Yeah. Uh, but at that point of time, you're like, ah, so B, and then I'm like, I'm a non-US citizen, can I actually start a Coinbase account? And the only way to secure your coins was using a co-wallet ledger, which is like the most painful process ever. And yeah, so it, was, uh, it wasn't it was fun. 
But uh, you could buy it off uh, centralized exchanges like Binance and all that. So that was cool. I didn't really buy it in 2017. So then there was a crash. Mm. And in 2019, I finally got into Bitcoin and Ethereum. Okay. Uh, so obviously it's like 10x, 15x from there. But the bad part is uh, I didn't put in more. I didn't allocate more uh, from my monthly income into it. Otherwise- um, Retirement, bro. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I mean, technically speaking, I if you ask me, right, if I want to retire now, uh, I I can, but I, I with my lifestyle. But that's retirement is more like a it's a popular target, But I don't think it's a. I really don't think it's something people should aim at because yeah. people literally like people physically die because they retire. They don't have a purpose. They don't have like a mission or I mean, it's cliche terms, right? Like, yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah, so I mean, that's, yeah. So then another barrier I had for crypto was the fact that uh, it was essentially greater fool's theory, right? So Bitcoin or Ethereum is valuable because someone else in the future will is willing to buy it from yeah. you. So it's not like an investable asset like uh, property or stocks or a business where you put in money, you actually do something and then you get a return and then the better mm. you do it, then the higher your return and all that. And then there's like an income stream essentially. All of that changed when I actually discovered Celsius early this year. Mm. Celsius is an app, uh, it's a centralized, um, I don't even know the right word, centralized exchange. I uh, know it's like, I don't even know what, what to call it to be fair. Um, and you know, our, our girlfriend Ross, right? He was like, yeah, yeah, you can you can put uh, Bitcoin Ethereum in, and then you can earn interest. I'm like, wait, what? You can earn interest? And I said, like, what do you earn interest in? Do you earn your interest in like US dollars or whatever? And they said, no, you can earn it in the in the token itself. Yeah. So in other words, Ethereum could produce more Ethereum. That was when it was, that, that was when it clicked. It should have clicked, to be fair, one year earlier. But uh, you know, again, I wasn't focused on it. So I was like, oh my god. So this is it. That's that's the final barrier gone for me, right? For me to put in more money because mm. now you could earn an interest, and not only that, then you learn uh, DeFi, right? You learn yeah. decentralized finance and how you can set up a wallet like the Trezor or the the co wallet style kind of uh, uh, you know wallets online. Mm. And there's no KYC processes. You don't have to put your picture like Binance or whatever, and then you earn yields that were crazy. Yep, yep. And that's like, I mean, this is for another time, lah. But that that is that is my story. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a it's an ongoing journey, right? And I think it's more healthy that you learn it that way than to be told that hey, bro, buy this and then it goes up and then you don't have any fundamentals of it. Yeah, yeah it, it's it's like goal, lah. And that's why I realized, right, that the goal was not uh, exciting or it's not an interesting proposition because after ten years your goal will still be the same amount. Sure, they'll, you will go up because of inflation, mm. but that's still like, it's not a non-productive asset. But when you look at the crypto today, a lot of it is productive. Yeah. So, so I mean, what is your, I, I think we'll, we'll leave maybe crypto for another day. I think okay, we okay. don't want it to be too too much. Otherwise there's gonna be like so many terms people are gonna, uh, the listeners are not gonna have fun. Roger um, that. But, What's the future for for Bradley? You know what what does uh, Bradley envision? What does he want to be doing? One year, two years, three years from now? I I think I've reached a point where I am, and I'm not saying this to get more clients or whatever it is. I truly, really enjoy training people, training really? myself, and I I see fitness being tomorrow at four o'clock. Tomorrow on, let's go. Okay, fitness. Oi, promote. Hey, yo, can you like <laughs> can you like beep that out? And people are gonna find us. Yeah, they get too crowded, right? I enjoy doing it, man. I really love just sitting down with a client. Hey, just tell me lah. Hey, how's you? How's your week been? And all that. Okay, okay. Hey, chop. Talk later. Do your bench press first. Okay, continue. I, I enjoy that interaction. I think. And you know what? Everyone listening to this, you know, if you ever have like a, an idea or you have no idea of where to go to do on a date, right? Bring a girlfriend or boyfriend yeah, or a guy, a chick or a hunk to a gym, train together because I think the act of, um, let's call it shared suffering, right? Yeah. Like both struggling and pushing through something and overcoming it is a very beautiful way to really loosen your gut and then get to know someone better. Yeah, that's know? true. And if you need a personal trainer, give me a call. Yeah. But 
I think the the answer to your question is fitness is going to be a big part, small part, some part of the trajectory of where I want to go to. That's for sure. Uh, I'm very involved with investing through whatever it is, stocks or crypto and all that. I would like to, in whatever capacity I can, to contribute to that uh, aspect of my interests. Uh, I'm trying to, I keep saying this, I should prioritize it more, publish this book on this. Uh, ah. Yeah, journey. yeah, tell us about your book. Like, what is it going to be about? And <laughs> So this journey of my diet, a few years back, I did a diet where I ate a, a nasi lemak every single day. Uh, and I got my body weight to go from 86 kgs to about 76 kgs in 100 days. Damn. So okay. 10 kg, uh, 10 kg in uh, three months plus, right? And I think my blood work improved, my heart rate, resting heart rate gone down. Wow. Essentially, everything improved by eating perhaps one of the unhealthiest meal that a Malaysian, tastiest, yes, but perhaps the oiliest, unhealthiest, whatever it is you may call it, meal a Malaysian can have, and I lost weight. I wrote a book about it. Uh, I did illustrations about it, I did a book cover trying to figure out what's the best way to get it to the masses. And I'm very much mm, procrastinating with it by doing a lot of other stuff, working, crypto, mm -hmm. all this stuff. Discord. But I need to work on it. Uh, I need to work on it. So that is that is perhaps some of the three or four big pillars that I have and I want to work on over the next few years, months, whatever it is. So I mean, back to your part about training, right? Like you can probably train two to three clients a day. Is that, is that normal, right? I think that on the the peak before the lockdown, before this lockdown even, I think sometimes you can see up to six, seven clients a day. That's a, a day. max, la. then I'm tired already. Then I really say, oh, screw it. Uh, I need to limit. Uh, yeah, I enjoy training people, but I think there's a, uh, there's a, there's a sweet spot that once you pass, right, conversations start becoming yeah. robotic and things just- What do you eat for lunch? Yeah, uh, okay, let's go. So yeah, five, six, seven, six, seven clients, a sweet spot. Lah. So like, this must, there must be a lot of traveling involved, right? Because uh, it, 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 because it's like, if they're all, all over, it's not like you mm. can organize it, okay, uh, I'll do all the PJ ones first and then we'll move on to all the Subang ones. And then from the Subang ones, I'll do all the, all the Monkara ones, right? Like you can do it, you, you can't do it in sequence because correct, people correct. start, you have to fit to their time, right? Uh, how do you even like, manage all that kind of uh, the, the logistics and all that and, in, and eventually some of the mental fatigue as well. I think the, I have to be smart about um, structuring my day. So I start my day usually in Satya Alam. That's where I have maybe two or three clients. Take a break. After that, uh, some clients in Monkara. After that, then usually it ends that way. Because this right. is my two main bases, right? Travel, focus on one area for a few clients and then travel to another few. Yeah. Right. So that's how I organize my day without getting burnout or without like driving 100 kilometers a day. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to ask you like some uh, questions about like your personal, like personal, personal finance, right? Mm. Like uh, I think we talk a lot about the money making portion of things, right? Yeah. Whether it's like excelling at your job or investments. Uh, let's talk a little bit uh, about your spending, right? So obviously you say you, you're very frugal, you've been trained that way, but uh, What's the worst thing that you've bought and what do you think is the worst financial habit you have? So let's start with the worst thing you bought. You know? Like you, you bought it, obviously every when you buy something at that point in time, you think it's yeah. a good idea, right? Yeah. But after you buy it, then it's like uh, absolute rubbish. Uh, I want to, I, this, this is something I've been asked before and I feel weird saying it because I use it all the time, right? But I think four years ago, I spent, uh, six figures by a car. It's the Mazda that I fetch you. Yeah, know? okay. Right. I wouldn't say it's it's a wrong decision, but I regret it because I could have maybe even paid half for a smaller, less fancy car. And should I have the knowledge on investment that I could have better deployed it, would have made multiples in returns, right? But uh, it is one that if I could turn back time, I would forego lah. Just buying a, it's not even a flashy car, man. It's a freaking Mazda. It's not like a Merce or BM. But, I realized that it adds very little to my well-being and my happiness in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. So obviously the car you were driving before was not as comfortable as the one you're driving now, right? Or was it like, what was the difference big? It's just, uh, it, I went from a Toyota Vios to a, uh, okay. a four-wheel drive. So it's an upgrade, yes. But it's a, not big. La. It's not big. Um, but yeah, I think that time also I felt like, hey, actually I got a little bit of money like, and uh, income security is somewhat there. Hey, why not I just buy a car? 
Right. I, I didn't know better, man. So yeah, yeah, of course. This is something we keep going back to, right? And I really admire what you guys do with education because if I had someone there to tell me or to just stop me to ask me the question, actually, you, you need a better car. You need to spend six figures. Yeah. Like, well, you can better use this money elsewhere. I had zero knowledge on that. If I knew how to deploy that, it would be, I mean, be much better off. Lah. Yeah, that's really true, right? I mean, like sometimes I wish that uh, I had a friend who was into DeFi, right, uh, 20, in 2020. And then he was just telling me, hey, you should try, you should try, you, because I store my my Bitcoin in this app called Coinomi. <laughs> I don't even know what it, what it is today. And I say, hey, why you store it there? Someone who just come up to me and say, why do you store it there? Why don't you just set up a DeFi wallet, oh, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's why I'm actually doing it to our friends, right, uh, right now. So I, I hope to... Uh, do things to other people what uh, Lord, Lord and Saviour Gibbon, Gibbon has uh, done to us, you know. <laughs> spread spread the gospel. So what is your worst uh, financial habit today where you know it's wrong, but you just keep on, you keep on doing it uh, uh, regardless. Like for me, it's sometimes uh, like maybe certain, maybe video games, right? Mm. Right, I buy on Steam or something like, you know, I'm just going to buy it. I'm going to play it for a couple of months and that's it, right? Okay. So two, two, 300 ringgit, whatever it is. Um, and and maybe, yeah, do, do, those are some of my bad financial habits. What, what's yours? Okay. Uh, this is something very recent. I just, I, I felt like I was triggered to feel bad about it. Okay. I was driving into, I was driving to the curve uh, and there was them jamma, whole parking and, I, I, it's a weird, it's a weird thing to feel bad about, but I feel like every time I use touch and go to pay a parking, I got paid a premium 10%, 15%, right? Uh -huh. I'm like, damn, this is kind of against the values that my mom and dad taught me. Right? Yeah. But it's so freaking convenient, man. Yeah. It's on a freaking queue and then pay that freaking machine with the one ringgit that I may not have. I put 20 ringgit, I get like 17, one ringgit back. I might as well just use my freaking touch and go and pay and it's 10 cents, like 30 cents extra. I, I want to say it's definitely not a bad thing when I put it this way, right? But I think I've been brought up to to be penny wise, pound foolish. Uh. So right. it's not a bad habit, but it's something that I need to learn to overcome emotionally, internally as a spending habit. Yeah, I actually have this, uh, I actually thought about it and you know, I, I, I like to think in like sequences and, mm. and, and, and in terms of like eras of your belief system, right? So, the worst one is to be uh, penny foolish and pound foolish. Right? That's, that's the worst, right? So I guess if there's anything to comfort you is that, you know, being penny wise, pound foolish is one level above that. Okay. Thank you, right? man. Thank you, so, sir. <laughs> so that's, that's great, right? So um, how do you track your finances, right? Do you do it like a girlfriend where you, they, he, you know, you track your uh, on an Excel sheet or do you ask her to track it for you? I have an Excel spreadsheet. I uh -huh. personally enjoy doing it. Um, so it's basically stock portfolio, mm. my crypto portfolio, uh, EPF, some of the bigger assets that I have. Yeah. So it's all into one nice little spreadsheet, update it, and it brings out a nice little pie chart for me. So I have a rough snapshot of how much allocation I have in uh, whatever investment vehicles. Uh, I look at it every month and uh, I try to maybe, and I haven't made big adjustments to it, but I try to make adjustments based on how much I should allocate going forward with the income that's coming in. But irresponsibly or maybe responsibly, I've been putting a lot more into crypto. Yeah. So you realize every single time we talk about something, it goes back to crypto. Like, yeah, okay, of course. Okay. It's a sign. It's a sign, yeah. yeah. So that's how I do it lah, through Excel spreadsheet. Lah. It's nothing fancy. Right. Yeah. So you mentioned EPF, right? I think that is uh, very interesting because you've you've essentially worked an employment in employment for nine mm. months in your whole life, right? Yeah. And usually EPF is an employment thing. And uh, what do you say like uh, the importance is when it comes to EPF uh, as a freelancer, especially? I don't have a lot of good things to say about EPF personally mm -hmm. because of, um, at least when I look at it in terms of what I could potentially generate through other investment vehicles. Uh, and, and you and I talked about this before, right? Yeah. It's, it's that, that four five percent is nothing compared to what we could. I mean, theoretically, if we're not stupid with our investments, lah, maybe yeah. in other places. But I just think it's like a habit that I have been ingrained with, and one can argue it's a good or bad habit since young that to, you should always leave something for the long, 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 long term. 
I think the inflexibility of EPF and you being able to put money in and being a pain on the ass to take it out is maybe a beauty, one of the beauties of that investment vehicle. And I don't have, I don't put a lot in. I maybe put about, uh, maybe about a thousand, thousand two like that in every month. And mm-hmm. over the past maybe six, seven years or whatever it is, it has compounded significantly. That's, yeah. But that's, that's just due to the nature of uh, long-term compounding and long-term investing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's okay. my thought on EPF. I don't like it, but I'm doing it sadly, emotionally and in a way sunk costs. Uh, you're doing mm-hmm. it so long already, right? Yeah. All right. I know one project that, uh, in fact, when we first uh, met, I remember, uh, what's, the, what's the word? I remember uh, stalking you. So uh, I then I discovered you have a YouTube channel, right? <laughs> and I know that uh, you're you're on and off there. But what are your what are your plans and your potential projects, man, for the YouTube channel? So whoever watches my YouTube channel, the three of you guys or whatever it is, uh, the podcast I really enjoyed doing the podcast I was doing yeah. for for time, mentors among us. But I think as a freelancer, solopreneur, whatever I may call myself, I think I really have to value my time and value the quality of how I am outputting or using myself. Because I know that at this critical busy juncture of my life, right? If I were to just focus on that podcast, which I want to, maybe early next year or end of the year, right? Quality is gonna be sucky. I won't have time to research on guests. I won't have time to uh, learn about them. I won't have time to prepare myself in the proper mental state to really interview them. And I don't want to, I don't want to do things in a shitty manner. Lah. Mm. Yeah. In fact, um, yeah, I used to vlog, right? And I yeah. really enjoyed vlogging because back then it was like a priority. I had time doing it and I just enjoyed kind of re- recording myself. Reviewing in burgers way. in your car, right? Yeah, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed doing that, but I realized that I want to also do other things and it would be unfair to that thing that I used to do versus that thing that I want to do to do both. Yeah. And it's a sacrifice that I decided to make. Yeah. Right. Man, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know what else uh, to ask, man. How to get a six pack? <laughs> Sign up with my services, brother. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, you, what would you say is like, uh, what, okay, so what would you say is, uh, okay, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sales pitch, like, okay? So why do you think people should go to you and to learn PT? Right, because as you rightly pointed out earlier in the podcast, it's essentially mm. a commodity, right? So it's just, it's just you. You have a meet. You are a meat sack. A lot of meat sacks out there who mm. can teach you how to curl, to right. squat. I mean, of course, there's uh, there's 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 quality of advice differences. But by and large, you know, a PT is gonna teach you how to squat pretty decently. You right, know? Correct. Yeah, I want to say, and there are a lot of great trainers out there. A lot of my friends. Uh, I mean, those who have at least been properly educated, uh, properly gone through the trials and tribulations of uh, lifting themselves. Uh, baptized by the iron. Um, but I think that where I am perhaps a little bit more different is my, I would say emotional intelligence. I don't know how, how self-absorbed that sounds, but I enjoy, I enjoy training people. I really enjoy having good conversations. I really enjoy doing that. I enjoy what I do. And maybe that rubs off to clients and mm. clients in a way enjoy the time that they spend with me as well. And being able to enjoy a gruesome process of losing body fat and lifting heavy weights, right? It's going to be super important for them to kind of sustain this journey in the long run. Right. I want to make that experience as fun and as friendly as and, and as less intimidating for people, anyone out there as possible mm-hmm. who wants to ape into uh, business mm-hmm. training and getting stronger and getting muscular. All right. Okay. That's my- I think it's, it's but where's the call to action, man? Where, where the call to action is can where, I leave my phone number. No, you just give your Instagram there. account. I think they can yeah, DM you, yeah, right? You my allow. Instagram is what's my Instagram again? I think it's uh, Berlin ninety one something like that. No, that's my that's my Discord, bro. Oh, is it? <laughs> my Instagram, my Instagram is How Chi Lim. Okay, H O U C H E E L I M. If you want to have training, you can leave uh, leave in the message there. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's where you can find me. So this is going to be like a YCS style podcast. So it's going to be a lot more unstructured uh, towards the end, right? So I'm just going to ask you certain questions like, uh, outside of obviously learning and studying about investing and mm. then training, mm. right? Are there things that you do, right? That's like recreational, hobby, fun. Okay. I mean, okay. so I'm going to chill you as well, right? Like, I think that, would you say us as, 
and I think I know the answer to this, like investors or whoever it is who are who generally inclined towards being fit and maybe being investors as well, right? We yeah. have higher risk tolerance, so higher tolerance or we understand risk very differently, I would say. Correct. Maybe the we are more action inclined, right? Yeah. I, I, I've only realized this much later in my in my life, like recent two, three years, that sports is very important to me, man. Mm. I really find that working out is great, lifting weights, lifting heavy, but I find that being on on a basketball court do, do you know what's the accurate word for sports actually? When you think about it from a from a fitness point of view? It's Bikes. called fun cardio. <laughs> good good way to put <laughs> fun it. Fun cardio. Yeah, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah. Playing futsal, playing basketball, like playing whatever, badminton, is a really good way for me to really, as an outlet, right, to exercise, to really drive or feed that competitive spirit and to really whack someone. Uh, ah, in a nice. way that doesn't kill them. Nice. Uh. Must be yeah. a physical sport. Uh. It cannot be like badminton or cannot something. Cannot be like, like darts or cannot be yeah. like... Is darts even a sport, bowling, right? Bowling. I mean, <laughs> do you sweat and that, you know? Yeah. Oh, man. Right. Negative calories, bro. You gain calories by playing darts. Yeah, because you're like, there's like beer and <laughs> chips at the side, right? Yep, yep. So, um, yeah, are you looking forward to any, um, you know, not cinemas or no, are you looking forward to any movies or just any series at all? Do you do you even like watching movies? Like, do you have an artistic side to you? Bro, I'm going to share this story. I, uh, I just share with you or not? Okay. Uh, I, I watch, I don't know. I have no artistic side. That side of me is non-existent. Okay. Uh, but I went to the cinema for the first time. For the first time in since the first lockdown now, uh, since the previous lockdown, sorry, I watched Sang Chi, and mm. it was I a cinema. You watched it you watch yesterday? Oh, nice. Seven out of ten. Shang Chi, same, I bro. I feel like it's not. Uh, it's Shang Chi is. Uh, it didn't hit the mouth. It was. It's too linear. Yeah, I, I guess you know where you're I mean? coming from. Yes, I think people hyped it up. Yes, I mean for sure, first Marvel movie in a long time, right? But I think it was overhyped, lah. As with all this movies, right? I think it could have been... But Tony don't carry the show in my opinion. I think his acting was superb. Yeah. Carried a large yeah. part of the show. Uh, but anyway, my experience watching it, I went to the cinema. There were only seven people, four of which are my friends. So it was such an empty cinema that we initially bought seats in like the middle of the cinema, right? Uh -huh. Then we're like, okay, since nobody here, we go back a bit uh, to some of the larger comfortable seats at the top. Yeah. Right? Woke up and then um, the there were two people just at the last row. We were at the second last row, right? Sit down. And then right, my friend turned back. And he saw that the girl was sitting on the guy. Oh man. Was okay. moving her, her body. Okay, around. okay. This is a PG. Okay, okay yeah, this is yeah. a PG. Uh, and then uh, I was like, podcast. damn, what's going on, man? Okay, okay, okay. okay uh, a... And it was during the beginning of the movie anyway. So uh, okay, I okay. think after that, it, it instantly stopped. We shall leave this there. conversation behind. Okay. Okay, no, so I, I, I only have uh, two but very big questions left to ask you. The first one is, What's something that, uh, you know, people really, uh, that when people think of you, that they don't expect you to, ha to, to have this or to be, to have this personality or to have this interest, right? Now what's one thing that when you tell people this, yeah. they usually get surprised. Like, I don't know, maybe like you say you're Indian or something like that, you know what I mean? What do you think? I've been huh? friends with you for two years now, right? I, like, did you answer the question? Huh? Oh, uh, I'll put you on the spot there, bro. I, I, I don't know what 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 do I think. Uh, I think what's uh, okay. This is not like a massive surprise, but this was more of a uh, mini U turn for me, right? So when I found out that you were a, a like a model and you were a PT, right? So you create an image in your head, right, of what a model is and. Mm -hmm just because of the nature of their job, they have to be a bit more self-absorbed. It's just naturally. And 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 you weren't, so that, that was a surprise to me. Yeah. So, but it's not, it's, it wasn't a massively shocking surprise, but it definitely was a, a mini surprise, but that's me. So what, right. what in your experience is that? What is one thing that people don't really know about you or they get it wrong all the time? Well, I suppose one thing that I wish people would know about me, which they find out sooner or later as well, is um, I'm, a, I'm a certified coach, Kind of like a life coach ah. where should you have any problems with, um, it's not, not, it's not a therapist per se, but should you have any problems when it comes to maybe more general ones, right? Business, relationship or whatever. I have the skills and the training of a coach to be able to kind of reflect that conversation to you, to, to help you out, to guide you on the process, to figure out the solutions to your answers, to your problems. Uh. All right. So 
I think that makes me a decent listener. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's an important skill, I feel, because generally people find out answers to their questions if they're allowed to talk. That's right. And only when they talk to someone who is able to reflect the right questions to them, they can help themselves out. If you have someone who always say, oh, yellow, yellow, hey, I also like that, you know, when you, you're telling them something, that's not going to cut it. So. And yeah, you're, you're right, because people listen to respond, right? We agree with that, a lot of them. Mm. That's why it, they, they end up not becoming a good listener. Actually, that's the second thing, uh, now that you mention it. So it's, it's listening. I think that's a fantastic skill. So yeah, I totally Thank agree you. with Thank that. You. So the last question is this, okay? Now, this is going to be a tough one. It might take a long. And the reason I ask you this is because, you know, I want this to be a long podcast. That's why. I how, my, how long do you no, want no, it to no, be? No, no, no. Just final question. Final question. But listen, okay. okay? No more and no less, right? What are the 10 biggest financial lessons that you've learned uh, before turning uh, th 30, right? 30, 30. No, not yet, right? Not yet, not yet. Not yet. So before learning to, what is the top 10? I want to say 30, but it's okay. be intense. Top 10, it can be as specific as you want. Okay. It's just maybe specific to you so you can. Yeah, a lot of it is going to be copied from some of the learnings from you guys or whatever, yeah. right? I yes. think number one, you got to contribute. You got to learn to contribute uh, whatever way, big way, small way, because that's the best way to make general income, right? Contribution, helping people to achieve their goals is going to be a number one way of generating income. Uh, number two, whenever you generate that income, learn to grow it however way you want to, but learn to grow in a way that you understand. If you don't understand investment, put it into your FD or put in your EPF. By all means, it's much slower and slower and smaller than other vehicles. Uh, go for it. Um, One down. Two down, bro. That's two. Yeah, that's two. Yeah. Okay. Number three, I think be open-minded. I think I was open-minded enough to uh, learn from you guys. Okay. Learn from you, learn from John. Uh, even though I also, I've already deeply entrenched myself into another investment course, but uh, I want to learn how you guys are doing things differently and ever grateful for that. Be open-minded. Um, number five, you know, five shit, I'm trying to hop. Hey, number four, I'm number counting, four, man. Number four, I think take risk. I think if you are at an age where, let's say 30, 30 is, and I feel I'm old, but I think in the grand scheme of things, 30 is the beginning of hey, things, Hey, look, right? Gary V was here. You know what he'll say, right? 30. 30 You're, still the yeah. You're still young. Yeah. Still young, He's still bro. young. Yeah. So yeah, take risks based on what you can afford to, you know? And maybe by that definition, it's not even a risk. It's a calculated plan move. Yeah. Plan. But take risks. Take risks and um, shit, man. How many more? Have? You got six, six more, more, right? Mm, I think also one thing that I recently came to uh, terms with is don't be afraid of asking for help. Huh? Because uh -huh. I think we talk about this, MJ. Yeah. For our generation, including you, including Gabe as well, we are gonna be recipients of perhaps the biggest wealth transfer in history yeah. from our parents who are boomers, right? And I think that if you were to maybe reach a point, let's say maybe in 20 years time when that money gets piled onto you, boom, I think you're gonna make a lot more stupid decisions than if they were to incrementally just pass some to you, pass some to you. Yeah. I've been a bit more proactive asking them to pass me some money for me to invest for their sake, for my sake, for everyone's sake. I think that it shouldn't be viewed as a sign of weakness, but a sign of responsibility of how to steward uh, family's wealth for the next few generations. Yeah, so yeah. that's what you're doing as well, bro. Yeah, yeah. five more. High five, bro. Five more, five, five more, more shoot. <laughs> five more. Uh, you you want me to help you out? Uh, I'll help you out with come one. Come on, come on. Uh, don't buy a, ma a Mazda. <laughs> don't buy a freaking Mazda. <laughs> don't buy a Mazda. Four more to go. Yeah. Mm, okay. Value your time. La. I think one thing I'm trying to do more of is to charge a little bit higher. Yeah, ah. that might ruffle feathers for a lot of my some of my clients, existing clients. But I think me wording it or structuring it in a way where telling them that um, I really enjoy working with you, and I don't want to diffuse my quality of my training for you if I want to make the same uh, or more by taking on more clients and really just not being able to concentrate on the service that I can give you. I think don't be afraid to ask for more. That is one thing I want to leave wow. with people. And it's gonna be hard, right? So hard yeah. to start a conversation here. Yeah, because you, I think people need to also learn yeah. like how to ask for more in yes. a way that is uh, not in, like offensive, right? right? And one thing that I recently found out that was has been helpful for me is um, be okay with paying a little bit more. Ah. I recently asked a friend of mine to draw something for a friend of mine, his birthday, right? Digital art. Lah. Then I said to him that, actually, please charge me your original rate. 
don't give me whatever bullshit, friend, friend, friend price, rate yeah. or whatever it is because I want to respect your time and your effort and your service, right? And uh, he gave it, he gave me a, 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 not an expensive price, but I think a price that's fair for him. And I think knowing that, right, I respect the craft, I respect the effort, I respect his time way more. And I think if we can develop this kind of relationship with kind of like the gig economy or the freelancer economy, people will be much happier serving and contributing and building things for the whole society. So yeah, that's number seven. Don't mind paying for more. I'm stumped. I'm stumped. Uh, yeah, it just meets people like Gabriel, man. Give you major alpha, bro. Yeah, in okay. The crypto world. Okay, two more, two more. Um, I think generally just listen. Uh, just listen. Just be a fly on the wall. You know, I, I through this podcast, you may realize I'm very talkative. I'm trying to like speak in the speed of like 50 words per 10 seconds really? I, don't, not, I don't think it's that but I mean, maybe faster than average but yeah. maybe not what you think it is but okay anyway go on but I think that the times that I learn the most is when I shut up mm-hmm. when I shut up mm-hmm. and I really listen and I try to listen without prejudice or without trying to chip in my thoughts I think right. that's when I get the most alpha sirs alpha mm-hmm. last one shit now I gotta really top the previous one for the last one the last one is just uh the last one is just stack Satoshis, bro. Uh, okay. <laughs> Maybe stack not Satoshis. Sa- stack, stack, stack some quan. <laughs> stack some quans. Quans, right? No, the last one. Maybe maybe it ties into the take risk one. Uh. I think that... Um, I think portfolio allocation is important. Yeah. Thanks to you, I learned that. And if you're not comfortable putting money into crypto, maybe consider just a 0.5%, 1%. It is extremely high risk. And if you lose money, not financial advice, okay, protect my own ass first. But I think if you can put in that 0.5% or 1%, you have some skin in the game, that's where you really put more effort and emphasis in actually learning it. Like what my Lord and Savior here, Gabe said, yeah. buy first, uh, ape first, study later, right? Yeah. Sometimes you gotta, ape, ape means just buying something, buying something with a small amount and after that you have more uh, willingness to actually learn it. Yeah. yeah. Again, not financial advice. So yeah, that's 10, I made it. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, Bradley, Thank for, you so much for, for hopping on. Uh, we have, uh, we've, I think this is the first time where you've been on our podcast and we've been on your podcast as well. Wow. The first guest. So, yeah, man. Yeah, let's make that an NFT, bro. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. And, uh, yeah. Hope you guys uh, enjoy this podcast. It's a bit, a little bit different this time, right? Maybe, uh, this podcast, right? Either you learn a lot or you learn nothing at all. That's the kind of podcast, guys. So, I uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, come watch some of our other podcasts. We have some uh, other awesome guests, people in the finance industry, the investing invest- industry. And uh, yeah, looking forward to see you guys in the next one. Ciao.